with us tonight. Others are still coming in. We're glad you're here. We welcome our guest preacher and looking forward to hearing the man of God preach. Brother Walford, let's ask God to bless this service tonight, please. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we bow in your presence tonight, Father, and thank you for another opportunity this side of eternity. Lord, to meet with your people. Father, we ask you to meet with us tonight. Lord, to share our welcome around here. Lord, we ask you to touch a man of God as he preaches to us. Lord, we ask you to help those that aren't here tonight or sick and hurting, Lord, meet their every need. Lord, I pray for those that are here tonight that are cold and indifferent. God, would you touch hearts and souls and change men's lives. And Lord, we're so thankful for this place. Lord, what it's meant through the years. Lord, we're glad. We're thankful, Lord, you kept your hand on this place and, and on the men that's led us. And Lord, we just ask you to have your will and way in this place tonight. We'll thank you and praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Couple songs together, everybody. Right, page 188. 188 at the cross. I for such power as I. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. good. Now let's turn to page number 515. 515 says Jesus came into my heart. Good song. Good song. Sing it out, George. Sing it out. Others are coming in. Sing it. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have lied in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart once a toy for my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart let's do that last verse now music here we go I shall go there to dwell in that city I know since Jesus came into my heart. And I'm happy, so happy as onward I go since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. Amen. Well, how many appreciate number one, your salvation? Amen. Number two, the liberty and freedom we have to gather on a Wednesday night in the middle of the week. And then number three, thank God, aren't you happy that the church didn't shut down? Amen. I praise the Lord for that. We have visitors tonight, and we welcome our visitors, Mr. Taylor here, uh, Brother Burgess's family. And I want to go ahead and say something that I did, have not said from this pulpit because I wasn't even aware of it until I received Brother Burgess's letter uh, just about uh, several days ago. And that is, uh, Miss Burgess, we are very, very sorry to hear about the home going of your mother. And it's all detailed here in the letter. And so I'm so sorry, I did not know. And uh, I trust she was a Christian, of course, 
born again in the presence of the Lord. The Bible said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I, I hesitate to tell you this, but it was COVID, right? And, and she was gone in like two weeks. And so I, I said something. I couldn't believe it when I read it. You ladies may want to speak to her tonight. You don't have to shake hands, but uh, let's welcome our visitors. And uh, Cam, if y'all can sing one, it'd be great. If not, we'll get Derek and them. But take a moment, and we've got a great crowd here tonight. Let's greet one another. Tell one another you love us. Speak to the sister tonight. God bless you while they play. Good to see. Good to see others that's been out of town. We're glad you're back. We appreciate you being back in the house of the Lord tonight. Uh, down front, down front, everybody, listen, okay? Down front, the Lord willing, after well, as soon as I get finished with this, I'm going to put Brother Burgess's most recent prayer letter. Very interesting, and uh, just appreciate this brother so much. And and I'm not going to get him to sing tonight. We got a song, but we are going to get him to preach. But uh, Brother Burgess, here's what somebody told me today said, if he could preach like he can sing, we're in for a great treat. Amen. So thank the Lord, all right? But uh, I want you to read the letter. Uh, he, Brother Burgess's ministry is to the disabled and beyond. And we support him, and we're glad to be able to be one of his supporting churches. But he has pictures here. And uh, it's just coincidence. Well, not a coincidence, but we just got this letter just like a few days ago. And now we're having him preach. So that's great. But it'll be down front. And there's some interesting stuff. You need to read about it. Uh, recent incident and then of course about her mom and just some great stuff here and it'll be down front if you'd like to read it all right now uh, immediately after the service if you'll come up here and get one of these alumni schedules for the game March the 26th everybody now if everybody texts me about March 25th and say now when's the alumni game I'm not going to answer your text <laughs> I'm just not I'm sorry but I'm just not going to answer you we're trying to tell you over and over. Here's all the information. I'll, I'll answer you. But anyway, maybe, Lord, will, I'll pray about it, okay? But uh, here's all the information you need. It's right here. And the schedule's down front. Who's playing when? What's going on? All that's happening. Well, you need that. And then all the, uh, the uh, revolutionary run participants, you need this form. Sponsor forms are down front. Liability to release forms are down front. And we're already getting sponsors. Isn't that good? Already getting sponsors. You've seen you, you keep working, all right? Or everybody keep working. This revolutionary runs a big fundraiser for the Mountain View Christian Academy. So please keep all that in mind, all right? Then last but not least, let's get ready for the Lord's Day Sunday. Then I want to thank Aaron Newsom. Aaron, thank you for ordering our solar-powered LED lights for the front. And um, I, I don't want to take a lot of time, but 
We, we can't do anything permanent out there. We can't because they're not finished. They have to asphalt. They have to put a big pipe in there, the moat is what I call it. So we're not doing anything permanent as far as our brick walls, our columns, our lights. We have our lights. So in the meantime, I've had Aaron order two solar-powered lights. And so, uh, Trey, thank you for putting them up this morning. Uh, they won't be as bright tonight because we haven't had no sun all day. The sun or stars had not shined in 14 days, all right? But anyway, so hopefully they'll be bright enough to mark that driveway. That's all we're trying to do. We're trying to mark the driveway so everybody turns in. So in the days ahead, they'll be ready to go, okay? All right, y'all come on. And they're going to sing one for us. And then uh, severe weather tomorrow is what they're saying. I'm not a meteorologist, so I don't know. But we have six carports around here. And if you don't have a garage, I have no problem at all with you bringing your vehicle back tonight and putting them on one of these carports because they are saying the threat is very serious and possibly very severe what could come, but it may not do anything. But if you want to use a carport, feel free. Then if the wind comes and blows the church away or the school away, you can't blame us, all right? <laughs> can't blame us. There was love at the cross where Jesus suffered pain. There was power in the blood that flowed from his veins. And there was joy at his presence when he rose from the tomb. There was life everlasting when he died for me and you. Love unspeakable and pain unbearable, forgiveness undescribable, and he did it all for me. Peace unexplainable and joy uncontainable, a witness unrestrainable when Jesus saved me. And there was shouting in heaven when I knelt there in prayer. When I called upon Jesus and he saved me there. And there was singing in glory when my name was written. Down in the book of eternal ages, it will ever be found. Well, my sin is untraceable, my name unerasable, my life unendable, my sins are in the deepest sea. A witness unrestrainable when Jesus saved me. Well, my sin is untraceable, my name unerasable, my life unendable, my sins are in the deepest sea. when Jesus saved me. Peace unexplainable and joy uncontainable, a witness unrestrainable when Jesus saved me. I like that, don't you? I like to call, just before the preacher comes, I like to call our five deacons up here real quick, if you will. They don't know I'm going to do this, but I want them to come on up here real quick. Uh, we have five men that are always faithful to church and faithful to help here in the church to serve the Lord. And um, don't know why I've waited all these years, but um, got them a little book. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to dedicate a book to them. I didn't write it, but I ordered it and uh, read through it, and it's really good. It's called The Baptist Deacon. 
and written by a pastor from a pastor with a special heart for deacons. And so we've got a presentation page on the front of it. And uh, man, I want you to know I love you. Appreciate all you do. And, and I appreciate your faithfulness to church. I mean that. Uh, what, who, who, would, who, who would need a deacon if they wasn't faithful to church? I mean, that's just ridiculous. Amen. And, and they didn't live right. And they didn't do right. And so I praise God these men live right and they do right. They support not only the preacher, but they support the church. Amen. Thank you, man. Let's give them a round of applause. All right, everybody, please. Please, all right. All right, now they got to read this book in the first week, all right? <laughs> no, I'll just read it whenever you want to. But I uh, just wanted to do, do, do something a little bit different. God bless you. Thank you so much. Brother Burgess, you come on up here. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate this man. And, uh, it's going to be a blessing to us. Look forward to hearing him. And uh, I told him we'd give him plenty of time. And you close however you want to close. Just turn that mic on. Give you some water. And uh, thank y'all just came into the balcony. <coughs> Honor to have you tonight. And God honor. bless you. God bless you. Take your Bibles tonight, if you would, please, and open up to Mark chapter number two. Mark chapter number two. I'd like to say, normally, whenever a pastor asks that I would come up, I don't have too much to be able to say other than just sing. And I do appreciate the opportunity of being able to sing for the glory of God. But I do want to say I appreciate this church, and I tell you what, I feel totally honored being able to um, be with you guys, worship with you. Every time our family has the opportunity to be able to come to Mountain View, I mean to tell you one thing, we leave with our batteries pumped. And I tell you what, I love hearing that choir sing, and just like, man, that good special we had, man, tonight, it's like, man, if they don't get your engine running, you ain't got no gas in the tank, amen. <laughs> And so, man, what a blessing it is being able to have a church like this and be, being able to worship the Lord. Amen. God is so good. Uh, God, you know what, listen, to, this month marks my 39th year of being saved. Boy, I say praise the Lord. Man, I stop and think back, back when I was in the Nellis Air Force Base Station in Las Vegas, Nevada that, uh, man, I was searching for everything that the world had to offer to try to fill that void that only Jesus Christ could fill. And, man, I'd come back from parties and be sick and be praying prayers like, oh, God, if you'll only help me get better, I'll never do this again. And yet the next weekend would come and I'd be right back out there doing it all over again. And, uh, boy, I had a guy that I worked with. His name was Joe Plyler. And, and Joe was faithful to witness to me and share with me. And he asked me one day, he says, James, he said, uh, we're having a study on the book of Revelation at our church. He said, he said, I'd like for you to come and be my guest. And I said, you know, Joe, he said, I, I said, I, I think I'll, I'll come. He stopped me right then, then and there. We, we worked on the swing shift. And Joe and I was in the metro van driving down the flight line. And... Uh, he uh, looked back in the rearview mirror as he was driving. He says, uh, James, he said, I want to ask you a question. He said, if you're to die today, do you know for sure that you'd go to heaven? And immediately I responded by saying, yes, I know that I'm, I'm saved. And I know I'd go to heaven. But whenever I said that, it was something like inside of me that was like a big question mark that just kind of ro rose its head up there. And it's like I heard someone say, but are you really sure? And uh, Joe said, James, you know, I mean, I, I couldn't lie to Joe because Joe and I, we worked together and he, he knew what kind of lifestyle that I lived and everything. And he heard about my weekends and what all things that I did and the people that I hung around with. And so I couldn't paint a rosy picture of the Joe and say, well, you know, I, I go to church on Sunday and, uh, you know, I try to live a good, clean life and stuff, which if I would have said he knew that would have been a lie. And, uh, but Joe says, James, he says, but the Bible says that you shall know them by their fruits. Yeah. And uh, at, at that point in time, I had no idea what in the world he was talking about. And so he began to explain it. He said, James, he said, if your casket was laid out here in front of the church and all of your friends were to come walking by and look inside that casket, he said, what would be the first thing that would come to their mind? And in my mind, I was thinking, well, if my friends were to come by and look at me laying in a casket, the first thing that would come to their mind was James likes to laugh. He likes to likes, have a good time. And he likes to party. I said, but not one of my friends ever would have said, well, I know that he's saved and he loves the Lord and he has Jesus in his heart. And that big sign that I had in my mind was like, it was a neon lit sign. It was like flashing, saved and going to heaven. Whenever he shared that verse of scripture with me, it's like somebody walked over there to the wall and took that cord and unplugged it, and that thing just went dead. And man, the Spirit of God began to deal with my heart. And I tell you what, I prayed to God many times before my life, but boy, that night when I got down on my knees beside my bed and I began to pray, I said something like this. I said, Lord, I said, I want you to show me whether I'm just, and I hesitated. 
I said, Lord, I want you to show me tonight whether I'm just backslid or lost. And whenever I said that word lost, it was like something that was in an echo chamber in my mind. It just was like lost, lost. And it's like God Almighty said, do you really want to see yourself for who you are? And it's like God took his finger and pulled a curtain back in my mind and showed me who James Burgess really was. You know, I, I really began to see myself as God saw me, as somebody that was totally lost and somebody that claimed that I had Jesus in my life and, and yet I didn't have Jesus in my life. And I was somebody that was believing a lie all of that time and I... The only way I can describe it was I felt like there was those two cowboys, men standing up there on the top of the mountain and they're slugging it out. And the one cowboy gets knocked off the cliff and he's holding on to an old root. And finally, boy, when the Lord showed me my lost condition, the root broke. And I felt myself dropping down into that abyss. And man, the only thing that I said that night was, Lord, save me. And man, that night, the Lord Jesus Christ came in that room where I was. And man, he did something in my heart, in my life. I didn't know how to explain it then, but I tell you one thing, I know it's real, amen. And for 39 glorious years, Jesus has been with me every step of the way. Hallelujah. Man, I tell you what, for years, the only way I would describe it was, Years ago when I was growing up, we used to have this York Peppermint Patty commercial. And this girl would come on TV set. She said, every time that I eat a York Peppermint Patty, she said, I feel like I'm standing on top of a high mountain with a cool breeze blowing through my hair. Well, I tell you one thing. I didn't have no cool breeze blowing through my hair, but I had some cool wind of heaven blowing through my soul. Amen. God took those sins and cast them away as far as the east is from the west and cast them into the depths of the sea, never to be remembered against me again. And I'd say, hallelujah, praise God. Amen. I'm glad that I'm saved. Amen. Mark, Mark chapter number 2, the Bible says, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. Man, I tell you what, whenever I read that, it's like the Holy Spirit just kind of says, Son, you need to take a look at that. And I got that word noise just kind of circled in my Bible. In other words, people knew about it. In, in other words, man, people said, hey, I, man, I heard that Jesus is there in that house. And uh, boy, if Jesus is there, we're going to get some help. If Jesus is there, someone's going to get some healing. If Jesus is there, someone's going to get some deliverance. If Jesus is there, somebody's going to get touched in their life. You look back at Mark chapter number 1, and we see, uh, man, in verse number 21, that uh, and, and they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. Man, I tell you what, that word authority there literally means power. When Jesus spoke, he had power. He had the anointing of God Almighty in his life. And whenever he spoke, things happened. Amen. And it wasn't like uh, the, the scribes and the Pharisees when they got up and spoke. Uh, man, they were just kind of getting up and they were just kind of uh, uh, repeating some words or maybe some repeating some doctrines that they had learned uh, uh, throughout their childhood experience. But it was dead. It was lifeless. Uh, I was at a church recently and uh, a girl got up to sing and she got up to sing and she stood up before the congregation and she said, well... She said, I was just trying to look for something to sing. And she said, the only thing that I could find to sing about was something doing with the resurrection. And I thought, dear Lord, I said, how in the world could that girl get up there like that and say the only thing that I could find to sing about was about the resurrection? And everybody just kind of sit there, and she had no, no glow about her. She had no enthusiasm about her. It was like, man, it was just like I'm going through the motions. I'm glad to say that, man, the, sir, the Savior that I'm serving tonight, he's alive. He's not in the grave. Hey, on the third day, death, hell, and the grave couldn't hold him, and he came forth a victor, amen. And he wants to give... You and I have victory today. Amen. Hallelujah. They were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, not as the scribes. And there was in their synagogues a man who had an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, uh, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Uh, well, Jesus says in verse number 25, And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. 
And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed in so much that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he the, the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. We look a little bit further, and Jesus is healing Simon's mother-in-law. And after he healed Simon's mother-in-law, the Bible says in all the city, verse 33, uh, was gathered together at the door, and he healed many that were sick with divers, of divers diseases, and cast out many devils, and suffered not the devils to speak, because they knew him. And uh, man, you, you go on down and we come to verse number 40. And the Bible says in verse 40, And there came a leper to him, beseeching him. That word beseeching literally means begging, pleading with him. I mean, a person in Jesus' day that had leprosy, I mean, there was absolutely no hope. There was absolutely nothing that no one could do for them. And, uh, and this man realized uh, in what short a matter of time that he had heard about Jesus. That man, if Jesus can cast the demons out of a person that is possessed, if, if Jesus can touch people that are sick, if Jesus can touch people that are diseased, then I know that Jesus can do something for me. And he says, Jesus, I beseech you, I'm begging you, would you have mercy upon me, Lord? Would you have compassion upon me, Lord? And, uh, and he was kneeling down uh, to him and saying unto him, if thou wilt, Thou canst make me clean. And, and Jesus moved with compassion. That word compassion literally means a love that compels you to do something. Man, you, you're just not unable to look at somebody in their time of need and, the, and that trial and test that they're going through in their life and absolutely do nothing. You know, you hear a lot of people sometimes say, well, I love you. God bless you. I love you. I'm praying for you. I want to say that that word compassion carries a great deal uh, of weight with it. it. It wasn't something that you just simply look at somebody and say, I'm praying for you and walk away and forget about them. But that word compassion carries the idea that that love, that, that earnest desire in Jesus' heart when he saw that man that was plagued with that lap, leprosy and and no one else was able to do anything for him. When Jesus saw him, Jesus' heart was so moved in such a way that he said, I'm going to do something about this. Amen. Man, I'm so glad that 39 years ago when Jesus saw me as a 19-year-old, that Jesus saw my heart and he says, I'm going to do something about this. Amen. And he reached his hand down and he saved my soul. Man, I don't want to ever get over that. Oh, my goodness. And the Bible says, as soon as he had spoken, verse 42, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. Man, I, did, I tell you what, I didn't have to pray for hours whenever I asked Jesus to save me. Man, I just said a simple prayer. I had no preacher that was there, but God was there with me in that bedroom. And I simply said, Lord, I want you to show me whether I'm backslid or lost. And the Lord, man, showed me my lost condition. And I called upon him in simple faith, saying, Lord, will you save me? And I'm so glad that the Lord did. Now getting back to chapter number 2 where the Bible says, And again he entered into Capernaum, and after some days it was noise that he was in the house. The reason I went back to chapter number 1 is because of all the individuals that Jesus has already touched in their hearts and their lives. Already we see the great miracle works of Jesus being manifested. And the last one that we see before coming to chapter 2 is this leper. And Jesus says to this leper, he straightly charged him in verse number 43 of chapter 1. He says, Forthwith he sent him away. And he said unto him, See that thou say, uh, say nothing to, to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priests, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Verse 45, the Bible says, But he went out and began to publish it much and to blaze abroad the matter. I want to say something. That if you have ever been touched by God, if you have ever experienced a, 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 a miracle work of God in your life, you cannot help but want to say something to somebody, amen. You cannot help but want to tell somebody what God has done for you. And this old leper, man, he knew that, man, he had no hope at all. And then Jesus came by where he was and touched him and cleansed him and healed him. And he said, i got to tell somebody about this. i got to tell somebody about this. Hallelujah. And it says it was noise that he's in the house. I wonder what would happen. Let's fast forward about 2,000 years. Here we are at Mountain View Baptist Church. I wonder what folks would be thinking that on a Wednesday night like this, 
that Jesus was going to be showing up at this church. I tell you what, I don't think that folks would care if it was going to rain outside. I don't think that they would care if it was going to be hail, storm, wind, tornadoes, whatever it was going to be. Man, I tell you one thing, Jesus is going to be there at Mountain View Baptist Church, and I'm going to be there, amen? Because I know that, man, he's got something that I stand in need of. Man, I'm sick and tired of going to churches where it's dry and dead and lifeless and nothing ever happens. But I'm coming to the house of God tonight. Why? Because Jesus is here. Amen. Man, I believe it with all my heart. Hey, we stop and think about it. We said, well, yeah, you know, but I've been to church many times. And, man, I really don't feel anything. Let me just say something, neighbor. You just got to get tuned in to the right channel. Amen. When, if you come to God expecting a blessing, you will receive a blessing. But if you come to God, if you come to the house of God thinking, well, it's going to be like it was last Wednesday night. It's going to be like it was, you know, the night before. Nothing big is ever going to happen. Well, then nothing big will happen. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6, the Bible says, but he that cometh to God. Man, I tell you what, you got to get this. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. That he is what? I know, but he is, I know that part, preacher. But what the point that I'm trying to get to is this. God will be to you what you want him to be. If you, if you feel like, man, God, you're not answering my prayers. God, you're distant in my life. God, I don't feel like that you're close anymore. God, I don't feel your touch anymore. Well, if that's the type of faith that you have, then that's what you're going to experience in your life. But if you truly believe with all your heart and your soul that God is a very present help in the time of trouble, if you truly believe that, man, Jesus is here to seek and to save that which is lost, if you truly believe that God is able to work miracles and manifest his power, then I want to tell you something. Every time that we get together as a people of God, we can expect to see great things. Why? Because Jesus is in the house. Amen. Oh, I tell you one thing, friend. Jesus is here tonight. And Jesus wants to do something in your heart and life. He wants to do something in my heart and life. If we will but open ourselves up to him and cry out to him and say, Oh, God, send that great, mighty, rushing wind through us, Lord, today. Oh, God, help us. And it was noise that he was in the house. Somebody say amen right there. And straightway or immediately... Many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. Man, alive. Man, one of the first things that I say about whenever Jesus is in our house, people are going to know about it. Somebody say amen right there. Man, if people know that, man, God is doing something at Mountain View Baptist Church, I guarantee you people are going to know about it. And man, if people know that there's a moving of God at Mountain View Baptist Church, people are going to know about it. Why? Because people are going to be talking about it. People are going to be telling people about it. People are going to be saying, man, you got to come to our church because God is moving in a great and mighty way. But I want to say more importantly, instead of saying God is moving at our church in a great and mighty way, God will be moving in your life Amen. in a great and mighty way. You know, the greatest witness that we have in this world that we're living in is when we yield ourselves to God and allow God to work a miracle in our lives, allow God to place his hand upon us, and allow, allow God to use us. Man, I tell you what, whenever I'm around some old preachers, and I'm getting there, amen. Whenever I'm around some older preachers, man, I like to get as close to them as I can. Man, I say, what, oh, God... I said, whatever that dear man of God has had in his life, that he's just been faithful to you. He's been a faithful preacher. He's been a faithful warrior. He's been a faithful so soldier, dear God. He's been faithful, dear God, to you. Oh, God, allow some of that anointing to come off on me, Lord. Man, we got, we got these so-called preachers coming out today. Man, they want to stand up there in the pulpit in their blue jeans and their old T-shirts and Man, they got to have their tattooed arm all sh hanging out and showing out. They got to have their earrings all in their ear, and they're trying to look cool, and they're trying to fit in with the crowd. I tell you one thing, friend, when God saved me, I was no longer trying to fit in with the crowd. I was just trying to, hey, be the person that God wanted me to be. Amen. They want to take the blood out of the hymn books. 
Man, they want to take the crosses off the churches because they don't want to offend anybody. Hey, I tell you one thing, I'd rather offend this world than to offend Almighty God, amen. The preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness, but unto us that are saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. I say it's the power of God unto salvation, amen. Oh, man, Jesus preached the word unto him. Jesus, man, I don't think that Jesus got up there and he just spoke to them. I don't think that Jesus got up there and just tried to put people to sleep. I think that whenever Jesus got up there, that, man, he spoke with all the power and all the authority that he had. Man, he realized the lost condition. He realized that the deception that had been placed on these masses of people by the scribes and Pharisees because they were dead, they were lifeless, they had nothing to offer these people. And Jesus looked at all these people and realized this is an opportunity that he had to be able to reach them. And God has placed people in your life and in my life that you only have one opportunity to be able to make a difference and reach out to them. We come to verse number 3, and the Bible says, And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. It's amazing in the word of God that none of these individuals are mentioned by name. They're just simply, there were four individuals that brought a man that had cerebral palsy. The type of ministry that we're involved in, pastor made mention of it. You know, years ago, we started off as a church planner out in Las Vegas, Nevada. Then we moved to a little town called Perrant, Nevada. And then we moved up to Canada for 12 and a half years ministering there. And we have no idea that God was going to be leading us back. I can remember driving back from California, uh, through California, coming back in 2015, and Brenda looking at me and said, says, Honey, what in the world do you think that God's going to have us to do? And I said, I really have no idea at this point in time. I said, I know that we, we, hadn't, we hadn't seen some of our supporting churches in years. And I said, I, I know that God wants us to come back and, and report to these churches and tell them what God has done in our lives. And I said, I know that as God has led us for all these years, that God is going to open up a door for us. But I just don't know what that door is going to be. Man, after moving into Bowling Springs and within two months, Samuel was, uh, had an opportunity to go to an adult daycare that was there. And... Uh, you know, Samuel has never been to any kind of adult daycare. We have always taken care of him. Yeah. And so I went there and I was going to check it out because I wasn't going to just simply drop my son off at some place where I wasn't going to be, feel comfortable with. Right. And I walked in there and, man, I looked around and I saw a cross hanging up on the wall. I said, well, praise God, that looks good to me. Yeah. And I uh, started talking to some people and then they started talking about prayer. They started talking about wanting to have preachers and churches come in there and, and minister to their people. And uh, the lady, she said, you're a preacher, aren't you? I said, I certainly am. She said, would you be willing to come yeah. and minister to our people here? I said, well, I tell you what. I said, if God opens the door, I said, I'll walk through it. She said, well, come on by. She said, I want to introduce you to some of the people that we have here. And, uh, boy, she walked around, and she began to introducing me to some of the people that were there. And, and there was a little girl that was there, and her name was Care Bear. And Care Bear, she had severe cerebral palsy. And Care Bear, she could not sit up. She couldn't operate a wheelchair. She couldn't talk. And if you were to lay her out on that communion table, she would about, be about three and a half feet long, and she was 32 years old. And uh, I walked over to Care Bear. And uh, I put my hand on her shoulder, and I said, Care Bear, I said, honey, I said, how are you doing today? And she turned that little head with those twisted up arms and had that mouth open, and she just tried to look at me and make some sort of sound. And I said this to her. I said, I said Care Bear, I said, Jesus loves you. I said, Jesus loves you. And when I looked into her brown eyes, it's like the Spirit of Almighty God said to me, He said, Son, He said, I want you to love these people the same way that I love you. I want you to take your hands and I want you to take your arms and I want you to embrace them. Amen. So often, individuals that have disabilities, individuals that maybe they can't talk, maybe they can't walk, maybe they look funny, maybe they, they walk funny, maybe, maybe they can't even uh, get up and get out of their house. You know what the majority of people do? We avoid them. 
It's like, man, you got something on you that I don't want in my life, man. You know, I, I don't want that. You, you, you obviously got something worse than COVID-19, and so I'm going to just ca- stay my distance away from you. Let me just say something, church. That's one of the worst things that you can possibly do. My son Samuel's getting ready, we're getting ready to have a birthday party for him. He's going to be tw- uh, 22, 32 <laughs> on the 22nd. I, it, I, my mind slips like an old transmission every now and then. He's going to be 32, but we're having the family come over on Saturday. And I said, uh, Samuel, I said, what do you want for your birthday? You know what he said? He said, I want hugs. I want hugs. Man, I tell you, there are some churches that I go to. And, and uh, man, I was at a church on Sunday. And, man, I, I, I poked my head in the door to look in there. And they had already started. Man, the church sign said 11 o'clock, and when I finally got in there, they said they started at 9.45. I said, well, somebody needs to change the sign, amen. <laughs> but, wow. I thought, wow, praise God, we're doing good, man. We're before church. No, we started at 9.45. Wow. But anyhow, before we got in that church, I had a brother come up to me. And, man, I hadn't seen him in a while. And he, he grabbed a hold of me and gave me, and I'm not too fond about guys coming up and hugging on me, but anyhow, this brother, he, he did it in the right way, amen. <laughs> he came up and gave me a great big old bear hug, and I hugged him right back. I could feel the love that he had in his heart. He said, brother, it's good to see you. Mm. I said, brother Burke, it's so good to see you too, my friend. Oh, you know, I, I stopped and think about the multitudes of people that are around us. And I notice in our church tonight, there's only one person sitting back there that's in a wheelchair. And let me just say this, in our communities, I guarantee you if we're to ask how many people know somebody that's disabled, wheelchair bound, I guarantee we could raise some hands. How many could raise some hands tonight? How many of you know some people that's wheelchair bound, got some disabilities, anybody at all? Yeah, yeah, some of you, yeah, some of you do, yeah, you do. You know, what, you know what their big problem is? Get in the church. A lot of times they have no transportation to get them to church. They have nobody to take them to get them to church. But, you know, these four men, they're not even named. They got together, preacher. Amen, they did. And I'm just kind of thinking in my mind, the movie house was closed down because there wasn't a movie house during Jesus' day. Amen. The dance hall was closed down because there was no dance hall in Jesus' day, amen. And so, I mean, there was, uh, there was no TV that was going to be on. There was no Mid-Atlantic wrestling that they could watch, amen. There was no NASCAR that they could watch. And so the only thing big that was happening in town that night was Jesus is here, hallelujah. And man, I tell you what, man. I believe those four guys got together on their lunch break and said, man, I don't know if you heard about it or not, but, man, there's going to be a humdinger of a meeting. Man, man, we're going to go to that thing. And I mean to tell you one thing, they'll be swinging from the chandeliers, man, before this thing is over with. Hallelujah. Man, they all four got together. Man, they were on their way to that meeting. And all of a sudden, that one guy, I'm just going to call him Joe. Oh, Joe, he said, hey, guys, wait a minute. You know what? Here we're going to this meeting where, man, people's lives are going to get changed. Man, we're going to see demons cast out of people. We're going to see people healed. But you know, oh, Frank, we pass by him every day in that marketplace. Frank, he's, he's that guy that's body's twisted up. They call it palsy. Samuel has had multiple surgeries on his body. He is still rod in his hand to straighten his arm out. He's had bilateral releases in his legs because whenever he was born, his legs crossed each other. His eyes were crossed. He had to have surgeries on his eyes to straighten his eyes out the best way that they could. He's wore splints on his legs. He's wore splints on his arms to help straighten his body out because as a child is growing, there's so much tone and tension in the body that the bones begin to bend under that tension. That man that we call Frank, I tell you one thing, that man was probably a twisted up mess if you were to see him. I wonder who was it that cut his fingernails? 
I wonder who was it that cut his matted hair. I wonder who was it that took him to the washroom when he needed to go to the bathroom. They didn't have the pins back then. And that mat that that guy laid on, it was just filthy. Because all that guy did his entire life was lay down on that mat and as best as he could, um, 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 crying out for somebody to give him a little something to help him out. He didn't have a stimulus check coming to him, amen. He didn't have any kind of welfare program coming to him. He had no social security benefits coming to him. He was just at the mercy of any and everybody that walked by. And Joe said to his four friends, you know, old Frank? Yes, sir. He said, I tell you one thing. I know we're already running late to the meeting, but we're going to go by and we're going to get old Frank and bring him to that meeting. Amen. Yes. And man, they got a hold of Frank. And they picked that man up and they brought him to that meeting. And lo and behold, they got there late. The parking lot was filled up. I mean, there was standing room only. Man, wouldn't that be great in our church, amen, tonight? That if all the seats in the house of God were filled up and people were standing on the outside trying to press in this building to hear the word of God preached, amen. Oh, man. These four men got there and, and the Bible says that when they got there, they could not come nigh, verse 4, unto him for the press. And they uncovered the roof where he was. Man, several things I see about these men. First of all, they had a faith to see the need of the Savior. Not just for themselves, but for, for this old man by the name we call Job. Second of all, they had faith to overcome obstacles. How are we going to get them there? I don't know how we're going to get them there, but we're going to get them there. Amen? And uh, so they got there at the meeting, and it was packed full. And they said, my goodness, we should have come here 30 minutes earlier, and we could have at least gotten close to Jesus. Oh, let's just go on back home. No use of us standing around here. No, 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 no. Man, that guy had the faith, said, I tell you one thing, we made it this far. We are not going back until we see Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Woo! Man, wouldn't that be good if we'd had that kind of faith when we come to the house of God? Man, we're going to be prayed up. We're going to be expecting. We're going to be looking forward to seeing what God is going to do in our church tonight. And then they pulled out the McCullough chainsaw. Now, I tell you what, we read about this, but I tell you one thing, if I was in my house... Preacher, if we were in this meeting tonight and somebody was cutting into the roof of this building, I know that there are some gun-toting deacons in this church that would be out shooting somebody. Amen. What kind of idiots cutting inside of our roof? I mean, sheetrock falling down, insulation falling down. Don't they know we're getting ready to have a rainstorm tomorrow? Amen. Man. (laughs) Tearing the roof up. And when they had broken it up, man, I tell you what, can't you see that? Man, Jesus is there speaking to the people. And all of a sudden, (laughs) insulation falling down. I mean, ceiling tiles coming down. And man, dust and dirt and all that stuff is coming down. People moving out of the way. And they let this man down. Man, I want to say that faith will overcome some obstacles. I don't know what kind of obstacle that you got in your life right now. I don't know what kind of trial that you're going through your life right now. You might be here right now. You might be saying, man, I didn't feel like coming to church. I didn't feel like I was going to be able to make it here tonight. But I'm doing everything in my power to be here because I want God to do something for me. I want to say something, neighbor. Just hold on. Help is on the way. Amen. Oh, my goodness. They lay down the bed wearing the sick of the paws. Uh, we're in the sick of the palsy lay. And I like what verse 5 says. And when Jesus saw their faith. Man, there's something about that. Their faith. He didn't say when he saw the sick of the palsy's face, but when he saw those four men's faith. What those four men were willing to do to get that, that sick man to Jesus. When he saw their faith. Man, I think that, that just kind of stirred and moved the heart of God. Man, I tell you what. 
whenever God looks at Mountain View Baptist Church and looks at your faith, when he looks at us as a church as a whole, hey, I want to say it would be fantastic, Pastor, that if everything that we do was always on top of the mountaintop, let, let's be, just be honest for ourselves for a moment. A lot of times, sometimes we might get up on the mountaintop every now and then, but a lot of our Christian journey is spent going through valley experiences. Going through trials, going through tests. I know that sometimes you hear about other people's lives and you think, my goodness, nothing, I mean, everything good always happens to them. And it's like, what's happened to me? You know, nothing good ever happens to me. We were serving in Pahrump, I mean, not Pahrump, Nevada. We were serving in Canada. I got up one Saturday morning and uh, got up to go, you know, get me a cup of coffee and start the day. And I got up and I walked through the house and looked, my front door was open. And I said, why in the world, how in the world could my front door be open? You know, and it, it gives you an unnerving feeling when you see a front door open and you've been laying in bed all night long thinking, good night, is there somebody in this house, is some axe murderer in here going to kill us? What, what, what's going on in here? And so, man, I walked through the house and looked around and I walked in Samuel's bedroom and Samuel has another brother. Samuel is a twin. And I walked in his bedroom, and Samuel was there, but his brother wasn't there. And I looked around, and I found a note on a table. And my son Josiah had written a note, and he says, Dad, don't come looking for me. I'm going out in the woods to commit suicide. I'm going to be honest with you. That just kind of takes the wind completely out of your sails, completely. You say, oh God, oh God, what are you going to do? Man, we had the police, we had search and rescue. And here I am, an American missionary living in Canada. And all that was going through my mind at that point in time is what in the world are all these Canadians going to think? Why is the police there at their house? Why is the search and rescue there at their house? Why are these things happening? I had to cancel my Sunday service because my son was found. He was over on the mainland. And I had to go over there and pick him up. And it was like it was a very volatile time in our life at that time. And you know what? There are things that you and I will go through. And at that point in time, I didn't want to go through anymore. I didn't want to experience any more tests. I didn't want to experience any more trials. I didn't want to experience my son writing another suicide note and said, I'm going to kill myself. But you know what? I, the only one that I could lean upon, the only one that I could put my trust in was Jesus. And I'm here to tell you tonight, he has always been faithful and he will be faithful to you tonight amen. 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 amen and when Jesus saw their faith he said unto the sick of the palsy son he said thy sins be forgiven thee I know a lot of individuals say, well, wait, 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 man, man the, the, guy, the guy, he needs to be healing. He needs to be touched. He needs to have his body straightened out. I mean, I, I tell you what, Jesus, man, he looks at what the real need is. There's a sin problem in each and every one of our hearts and our lives. And I want to say something. Just because you're in a wheelchair don't mean that you're going to heaven. I tell you one thing. A lot of individuals look at people that, are, that, that, that might have cerebral palsy, that might have Down syndrome or whatever, and, you know, and I, I'm, not, I'm not going to be the judge, but I tell you what, God is the one that knows all things. But let me just say this. Just because somebody's in a wheelchair doesn't mean that that mind is as good as your mind. It means that they have a body that will not work like your body will. And, and, and so everybody needs the Lord. Somebody say amen right there, amen. That's why we're doing the ministry that we're doing right now. We are giving them a message of hope. We're giving them a message that, hey, Jesus is here to help you. Jesus can see you through this crisis in your life if you'll only put your trust and faith in him. Amen. Jesus says to the sick of the palsy, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Man, not only was there that healing of the sins that was in this man's life. But you look at verse number 11. I, I, don't, I want to back up for a second. And verse number 7, the Bible says that the scribes sitting there reasoning in their hearts saying, why did this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? I say, amen. 
And immediately when Jesus perceived in the spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk. I mean, anybody can say, Thy sins be forgiven thee. But how many can say to a crippled up man laying on an old dirty mat, no telling how many years Jesus looked at that man, but I say unto thee, take up thy bed and walk. <laughs> hey, and the word of God says, but that ye may know, in verse number 10, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thy house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. Man, at our church, we were singing victory in Jesus. I purposely left out the second verse. Because every time that I would sing the second verse, how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see, I'd hear my son in that wheelchair with all of his power trying to to get out of that chair. You know, when you have a disability and you're living in a body that has you imprisoned and you see everybody else walking, you see everybody else enjoying life and your life is spent in a chair you can't dress yourself, you can't feed yourself, you can't do anything. Everybody else has to wait on you hand and foot. And your world is what takes place right here. Man, I've preached so many times about Jesus' healing power. And Samuel's back there moving around. He's trying to break free of the straps that's got his body tied down in that chair. And I tell you what, preacher, my heart broke for my son because I know that he, he was so bound up with his faith that he was saying, Jesus, man, I'm singing that song, how he made the lame the wall. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, do it now, do it now, Lord, heal me. But do you know that everybody that lived during the ministry of Jesus, not everybody experienced healing. Not everybody experienced deliverance of leprosy. Not everybody's loved one was raised back from the dead. But there were some that were touched by God. Just like some of you here tonight, you've been touched miraculously by God. God has anointed and blessed you, and, and the least thing that we could do is raise a hand toward heaven and say, thank you, Jesus, amen. Oh, Lord, you've been so good to me. Man, I tell you, a lot of times we don't know how good we have it until something is taken away from us. I got sick several months ago and man it made me feel so bad and so every morning that I get up I sit down at the table to have my devotions with God and before I do anything I said God I want to thank you for life I want to thank you for health I want to thank you for strength I want to thank you dear God for your many blessings on me amen man I want to take that for granted man I stop and think about this these four men the obstacles that they had to overcome man that old person by the name of, did we call him Joe? I think it was Joe Frank. Frank, I got it mixed up there. Whatever his name was. They wanted to take that man to Jesus because they knew what Jesus could do, could do for him. And I'm wondering, who has God placed in your life? Man, you know people right now that are eaten up by sin. Their lives are messed up. And you look at them and you shake their head and just say, oh, Lord. Well, that's a messed up case there. Unless they get saved, they're going to bust tail wide open. Well, you know, maybe the reason that God has placed you in their life is because he's wanting you, like one of these four unnamed men, to be that person with compassion that's going to love them the same way that Jesus loves you. And when Jesus saw their faith, man, it caused the heart of Jesus to move. 
And I want to say, may the Lord do the same when he looks at us. Father God, I ask and pray tonight that you take this message, these few rambling words that I've talked about tonight, about when Jesus is in the house, what's going to take place. Oh God, I know that you want to work in a great and mighty way here tonight. God, I don't know what burdens people are carrying in their life. I don't know what trials that they're going through with their family. I don't know what kind of sickness, dear God, that they've had to deal, deal with in their life. But dear God, I know right now in the name of Jesus that you have all power. Oh God, I know that you can do the miraculous. I know, dear God, that you can bring deliverance in our life. I know that there is no son, there is no daughter that is too far gone, dear God, that you cannot reach and bring back. And so God, we're asking and praying tonight that you'd move in a great and mighty way tonight and you'd help to stretch our faith, dear God, that we would be the type of church, we would be the type of individual Christians, dear God, to believe you, dear God, for the miraculous. Oh God, would you move here in a great and mighty way tonight? If there's somebody here, maybe you've kind of gotten astray, maybe you've gotten cold and indifferent, maybe there is something that's in your life that just kind of got you sidetracked. Man, will you exercise that faith tonight to say, I'm going to get my eyes off of what's got me sidetracked and I'm going to get my eyes back on Jesus because Jesus, you are the answer. Maybe somebody would like to come tonight as the, as the instruments are being played. Whoever it is, may God speak to your heart. May God move in a great and mighty way. Oh God, have your will in your way tonight in this service. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you for your compassion. Oh, God, thank you for those four men that wouldn't stop at whatever was facing them, but they kept on keeping on, dear God, to bring that one man to Jesus. May we do the same in the days that we're living in. Help us, Lord, I pray. Help us, Jesus. Pastor's going to come, and he's going to close the service as he sees, sees fit. May the will of the Lord be done here tonight. Page 337. 